Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Good Friday service. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say it because a few people have said it to me. We're at church, so good morning. Uh, our time tonight is going to be a little bit different than a normal service would be, but we're going to take some time tonight to ponder, reflect, and be reminded of the gruesomeness of our sins that Jesus himself bore on his body on the tree. But we're going to begin our service by recounting some of the events that led up to the crucifixion. So first, Jesus goes with his disciples out to a garden to pray, where one of the disciples that he had spent the past three years pouring into, living life with, and community with, betrays him. That, that disciple Judas brings soldiers armed to the teeth to betray the one Messiah for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus is then brought before the high priests and Pilate and given a mockery of a trial. Another one of his disciples, Peter, betrays him three separate times. Pilate then offers a substitute in Jesus' place, but the crowds want Jesus' blood, not Barabbas. So Pilate hands Jesus over to be crucified. And picking up in John chapter 19, verse 16, it says, So they took Jesus, and he went out, bearing his own cross, to the place called the Place of a Skull which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but rather, this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Would you please pray with me? Holy and loving God, as we prepare to set aside our busyness and to focus intently on Jesus' suffering and death, we ask for eyes to see all of the amazing things that Jesus' death means for understanding you, your love, and our salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us as we contemplate together how deep the Father's love is for us? How deep the Father's love for us. Treasure, how great. 
seated. Everyone everywhere at some point will need to answer the question that's behind me on the screen, who is Jesus? And one of our jobs as Christians today is to do whatever we can to share about Jesus with as many people as we possibly can before he returns or calls us home. But let's look at a few uh, key moments in the Bible where we see some allusions, some references, some situations that point us to Jesus. So first of all, remember that Jesus was not God's plan B. He didn't create the world, see it fall, and then go, "Uh uh-oh, we need a do-over. Instead, Jesus was made before he laid the foundations of the world to come to the earth and bear the penalty for all of our sins. See, Jesus eternally existed in loving union with his Father outside the confines of time and space, but then he came down to earth and confined himself by time and space over 2,000 years ago. First time we see an allusion to Jesus is in Genesis 3.15. So in Genesis 3, death and sin had just entered the world. The serpent had deceived Adam and Eve, and the perfect relationship that God had with his creation had been severed. So God tells the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. That's saying that an eventual offspring of Eve will come along and restore this broken relationship. But it will take time, and it won't be how anyone on earth expected it to look. Now think of another story in Genesis chapter 18, where Abraham is interceding on behalf of Sodom. So he knows his his nephew Lot is living in this town, and he asks and begs God to not destroy the town for 50 righteous people. And God relents and says, no, for 50 righteous people I will not destroy it. So Abraham has the audacity to go back to God and say, what about a smaller number? What about 45? And God agrees. And then 40, and God agrees. 30, 20, all the way down to 10. And God agrees that if there are 10 righteous people found in this city, I will not destroy it. 
Now, it's important to note that God, God isn't offended. God doesn't condemn Abraham for, for it. In fact, Abraham didn't go far enough. You see, God was waiting for Abraham to ask for just one righteous person. And God would have agreed. One righteous person is enough to bear the penalty for this entire city. But even that wouldn't have been found. Uh, think of another primary character in, in the Genesis story, Joseph. Joseph was betrayed by his brothers. He was neglected in prison numerous times. He was accused of impropriety, but he never lashed out. By his suffering, by Joseph's suffering, by his life, he saves God's chosen people, just like Jesus will one day do. Toward the end of the book of Genesis, Joseph's brothers are worried as, as Isaac is succumbing to illness and death. And, and after their father Isaac dies, they come to Joseph and ask him to make some kind of covenant with them. And Joseph's reply is, you meant this for evil. You meant evil against me, but God, God meant it for good. Similarly, when Jesus is about to be on the cross, he is betrayed by his brothers. And all these things that, that these brothers meant for evil, God turns around and uses it for good. Time prevents me tonight from walking through every other book of the Old Testament, but Jesus proves himself time and time again to be better. He proves himself to be the better Adam, who did not succumb to temptation. He proves to be the better Joseph, who lives perfectly righteous. He's the better Moses, who arrives as a perfect priest. He's the better King David, who never succumbs to sin and leads his, perfect, leads his people perfectly to never lose any battles. He's the better prophet compared to any of the other prophets. Yes, even better than Amos that we're studying together right now. Because not only does he perfectly prophesy, but he also provides a perfect atoning sacrifice for the sins of you and me. Isaiah even reminds us that Jesus is the sacrificial lamb who knows what it means to suffer. The Psalms remind us that he alone is worthy to be worshipped. Ecclesiastes reminds us that he alone gives us a reason to live. And the very last book of our Old Testament, Malachi, ends reminding us that he is the better Elijah. We spent two months together at the beginning of this year studying together the truth that he is the bread of life, the light of the world, the door, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth and the life, the true vine, and ultimately the great I am. He was the perfect son of God who lived the perfect life we could never live and came to die the death that we should have died. I invite you to stand again as we continue singing together.
wonderful is my Savior's love for me. You may be seated. Let me ask you a question. Who are you? Really? When a person is asked this question, they often give you brief answers that describe an aspect of themselves, but they, they never give you the full picture. And why is this? It's simple. We either don't know, or we actually don't, don't want to know the answer to that question. We think we want to know. But when faced with the question, we often choose to look at ourselves for the answer. But in reality, our identity is a pale facsimile of what we once were. There was a movie that came out a number of years ago in the Star Trek series called Star Trek Generations. The antagonist of the movie was a gentleman who had experienced paradise, and then he lost it. And he spent the rest of the time doing anything and pushing anyone out of the way that would keep him from getting back to perfection. This is us. We once had our identity. In the Garden of Eden, we had our purpose. And it was clearly laid out upon creation. We lived in paradise, in perfect harmony with our Creator and with one another. But we chose to rebel, become our own authority. We seduced ourselves into thinking we could do a better job of finding our purpose. The consequences of this choice were deadly, both in physical reality and spiritual condemnation. And now, we desperately want to get back to this, but we don't know how. Romans chapter 1, verses 20 through 23 says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God, nor gave thanks to Him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God This is where we are today. This is where humanity stands, darkened and groping around, searching for purpose and identity, the very purpose and identity we scorned and continue to do so today. God is still around us, and His qualities are in every part of creation, in every part of us, and yet we willingly and willfully ignore what is right in front of us. We know there's a Creator. And yet we wish to usurp the throne. We seek to find purpose and meaning through band-aid solutions, all the while ignoring the calling of our heart to be reconciled once again. C.S. Lewis wrote an allegory of Christianity in his series, The Chronicles of Narnia. And in the final book, The Last Battle, at the very end of the story, the heroes, the people who have been valiantly battling the, the enemy and defending Aslan, they're thrown into a stable to be sacrificed to a false god. But Aslan, who we know is the characterization of Jesus, rescues them and brings them to the promised land. But strangely, there were a group of dwarves who had been rescued also, but they refused to acknowledge Aslan. And so when they were thrown into the stable, they were blind. The heroes, all followers of Aslan, found themselves in, in this incredible paradise, surrounded by incredible beauty, but they watched in awe as these dwarves could not and would not see the beauty around them, but instead continued to wander around as if in a dark stable. Who are we? We are people who have lost our way. We've forgotten our purpose, but more importantly, we have lost our identity. 
We were created in the image of the Almighty God and given a purpose through Him. Yet we do our best to subdue the light within ourselves and dim the light of others. We wish to become greater, but we cannot wrap our minds around the futility of this gesture. We continue aimlessly and determined to find a better way, all the while ignoring the clear path and the beauty that lays ahead. And ironically, already knowing the answer, but not liking it, we constantly ask ourselves the question, who am I? Let me introduce you to yourself. You are alone, a solitary figure connected joint and bone to no one but yourself. And this is the life you chose. Let me introduce you to yourself. You are cut off, separated. You ran into your isolation. And now there is no way back into the family from which you came. Let me introduce you to yourself. You are stained. You have sealed your isolated separation with guilt. Let me introduce you to yourself. You are under the shroud of slavery. In trying to own yourself, you became owned. Your master is your sin. You serve nothing but your own isolation and separation. This is your identity. This is who you are. Next question is, what are the consequences for our sins? Because ever since Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we as humans have tried to make our own way to deal with our sin. So what did Adam and Eve do right after sinning? In Genesis 3-7, it says that they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. They knew their guilt. They knew that they were exposed. So to attempt to deal with it, they tried covering themselves up. Or what about the Tower of Babel? People were going to reach the same level as God. If only we build a high enough tower, if only we work hard enough to reach heaven, we can do it by ourselves. Think of the Passover event where God's people used blood to cover the entrance to their homes and then watched as death literally passed over them. Think of the potent picture that would have painted in all of their minds. But that's not the only place we see blood in the Old Testament. Think of the whole Old Testament sacrificial system. There were daily blood spectacles where a perfect lamb was killed in place of God's people. Each individual day had its routines. Each year had its certain festivals. All of them were religiously followed to ensure that sins were dealt with. How do you think the people felt as they saw day after day the animals being led to the altar to be slain to fix and address their right standings before God? And how often do you think the people worried that even those sacrifices weren't quite enough? You see, God's people, even when they know the truth, even when we know the truth, are still tempted to try to deal with our sins in our own power, in our own strength. Many of us who grew up in the church can go skipping down the Romans road. We can walk people through the wordless book. I was even taught one time how to explain the gospel using jelly beans. But deep down, don't you always feel like you still need to do something else to atone for your sins? We all know, as Romans 3.23 reminds us, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We know that when sin entered the world, death also entered the world with it. But do you ever feel like it's just too easy? You gaze into the mysteries of the gospel and worship Jesus because he bore a heavier weight than you or I will ever need to deal with it, ever need to deal with in our lives. Because Jesus never sinned, not once, not in thought, in word, or in deed. He never got sinfully angry. He never snapped back at people. He never did something poorly. He never misspoke. He never lied. He never cheated. He never stole, even from people. He was patient 
and kind. He was long-suffering and always willing to endure all things. That man, that perfect man, who actually lived and walked on the earth, was offered up as the once and for all sacrifice for the sins of the entire world. That is for the sins of you and me. And now, the only thing left for us to do is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. That's it. We no longer have to keep track of our good deeds versus our bad deeds. We no longer have to compare ourselves to those around us. The only thing we need to do is keep our gaze fixed on Jesus. And when we do that, we can know with complete confidence that our sins are forever dealt with, that God will cast our sins as far as the east is from the west. But there is still something else that God asks us to do. In 1 John 1, 9, uh, the author John reminds us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Martin Luther famously said, Our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ, willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. Now, this doesn't mean that we just throw up our hands and, and give up. Instead, it urges us to be quick to deal with our sin before God and then pursue holiness on a daily basis. We're going to show a video in just a second here that recounts all the events leading up to the crucifixion, followed by some time for you to pray, to reflect, and to ponder on your sins that Jesus died for, and then the encouragement for us to continue living as Christ has commanded us to live. That is a life of repentance. So after the video is done, there will be some verses that will be cycling through on the screen behind us. Uh, so as, as those are cycling through, please take some time to ponder, silently reflect, silently pray about your sins, the sins that we committed that Jesus bore on, in our place on the cross.
Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart, you're the one who guides my Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Stand with us as we continue. Runs deep, your grace is more. The grace is found, is where you are. Where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. sacrifice that was made on our behalf. That you would love us enough to make the choice that you did, Father, is something that we can't fully comprehend. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the sacrifice on the cross. And the word thank you is, is not enough. Father, thank you for Jesus. And it is his name, in his name that we pray. Amen. This concludes the formal aspect of our Good Friday service.
We're going to continue to have scripture on the screen. If you would like to take some time to meditate over that, you are welcome to stay here for as long as you feel comfortable. If you are not going to stay around, we do ask that you please exit quietly and quickly to allow those that are going to remain to meditate. But as you leave, take time to ponder over the sacrifice that was made, the blood that was shed. In the words, it is finished. You are dismissed.